We're adding this section on because we have some more time left on the CD, and it gives you a flavor for um, how our lectures go, our substantive law lectures that we have on CD. And uh, But we want to clear something up for a lot of folks. Um, first thing we want you to do is grab your uh, Foldies Criminal Law 1 and look at what's on that Foldies Criminal Law 1, but we want you to specifically go to the, the first column in that Foldies on the left and look at the Model Penal Code. And on there, it has four different states under the Model Penal Code, and we'll use this as, as how we teach you this concept that we're trying to teach you. And what we want you to do is I want you to grab four pieces of paper, four eight and a half by 11, and put them out. And on that first piece of paper, take that, and I want you to, and, and I want you to draw a relatively small circle. Um, draw a small circle, and in the center of that circle, put the word P. Okay. And obviously, when you're looking at the model penal code there on the bottom, P stands for what? Purposely. Okay. When you do something purposely, you have a conscious desire to do it. Um, case in point, oh, geez, I'm going to go kill my next door neighbor. Okay. Or I'm going to kill, you know, the, the guy who's sleeping with my estranged wife. All right. I want to kill him. I'm going to grab a gun. That's all I want to do. I want to premeditate and deliberate. I want to lie in wait. I want to shoot that person. Okay. With my gun. So, purposely, you have a desire to do something. Now, that's that first circle. Now, take, take, draw a circle around that, a little bit bigger circle, and kind of like right where you, you wrote the P, right underneath that, inside that second circle, but outside the first circle, draw a K, which is knowingly. Okay? Uh, terrorists, knowingly, you know, a substantial certainty that something's going to occur. Well, geez, you know terrorists sitting there and, and saying to the, to, the, to the jury and the judge, well, geez, you know, uh, all we intended to do was just blow up the airplane, okay? Uh, and we set the bomb for four hours, and usually that airplane, you know, stays at the hangar for overnight. How were we to know that that airplane was going to be used as an emergency flight to put 150 people on it, and that, you know, four hours later when the bomb goes off, all these 150 people are going to die? That's a substantial certainty. What's the substantial certainty that when a bomb goes off in an airplane, it's going to be in the air and people are going to die? That's a pretty good substantial certainty. Okay? So, that's the knowingly. Now, draw a bigger circle, you know, that encompasses the first two, but gives you enough, enough, enough space that, you know, now you get your P and your K kind of lined up so you make it real neat. You know, got to be neat doing this stuff or you won't learn anything. Um... And under in that next circle, in that bigger circle, we're going to write R for recklessly. Okay, um, uh, you're aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk. Um, example: uh, You just got your new Porsche uh, from your stock options in Silicon Valley, and uh, you got to test it out. I mean, you just drove out of the dealership, and about a half mile down from the dealership is a little school area. Okay. And, you know, it says 5, 10 miles an hour, and it's little grade school and the little kindergartners. But, you know, it's 3 o'clock. They're all out of school now. They get out of school at, you know, or excuse me, it's 3.30, and all the little ones get out of school at 3. You're just kind of looking around, and you figure, what the heck, the lights are still rolling, you know. Uh, the lights that say, you know, 5, 10 miles an hour, they're still flashing. But you figure, ah, it doesn't look like there's anybody around. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to floor it. Okay. And in the middle, while you're flooring it, all of a sudden you see this gorgeous-looking man or a hunk or it, depending on your proclivities. Um, and you see this gorgeous hunt, a hunk and uh, or woman or whatever it is that turns you on. And you start staring at her, and meanwhile you're going like 70 miles an hour in this school zone. You know, because you know the minute you step on that gas pedal, you have no idea how that thing takes off like a rocket. And just about the time that you turn around to to figure out where you're going outsteps little junior, you know, from kindergarten, because he was a little bit late getting out of school, and you run him over and you kill him. Now, that's recklessness. There's, you're aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk. What's the substantial and unjustifiable risk? Speeding in a school zone, you know, and you just don't do those kind of things, okay? And you even took your eyes off the road to look at, you know, your dream of dreams passing by while you were going down the street, you took your eyes off the road. Do, do you know, reasonable people do that kind of stuff? Isn't that, like, super recklessness? Okay? So that's the reckless kind of intent that you were trying to portray there. And, again, now, that you have three circles. You know, in the center of the first circle is P, 
and underneath that in, in the second circle but not in the first is the K for knowingly and the next circle around there in in you know it's it encompasses the first two circles and in there is the word R okay and then even a bigger circle let's draw the bigger circle and put the word N negligently in there so now we have all those mental states well what's negligence negligence in criminal law is the same as negligence in civil law except there's a higher degree of risk and there's a higher degree of harm it's the same exact same thing as tort negligence except there's a higher degree of risk and a higher degree of harm negligence is tort in tort is conduct that falls below the standard established by law for the protection of others against unreasonable risk of harm criminal negligence is the same except it's a higher degree of risk and a higher degree of harm that's all it is okay a lot of times you can almost classify it as gross negligence but it's not it's criminal negligence that's what they call it so now we have this wonderful little piece of paper Oh, and by the way, besides getting a pen or pencil, you want to get some like crayons or something to color in these things with, or imagine that you're coloring them in. Um, but if you color them in, you'll learn it better. Um, but anyway, you have this piece of paper now, and you have f f concentric circles like a bullseye, you know, in the center, and it's just like a target that you shoot at. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw these same patterns on the other three pieces of paper. So do, go do the same thing and draw these out. And you know, drawing them out is very important, and I'm not being facetious at this point in time, even though with the crayons and everything else we were. Drawing them out is important because it's going to reinforce how you think about these. So draw these other, draw the same pattern out on the three other pieces of paper. Now, so if we put the one piece of paper off to the side, and we take the second one that we drew. Now let's color in the P and the K. Make that all one, you know, spot. Okay. And then you draw a little line out from that colored in bullseye now, that bigger bullseye that you drew. And we're going to call those P and K crimes. We're going to call those specific intent crimes. It's a set. This is set theory. And if you were good in math, you'd have been in med school. But this is all set theory. Okay? So P and K crimes, they're specific intent crimes. Those are the crimes that you have to commit with purpose or substantial certainty. There's a whole slew of specific intent crimes. All right, that stand alone by specific intent. In other words, the only way you can commit them is you have to have the purpose or knowing intent to do those acts. Okay. Now, those are that's relatively easy to understand. But here's where a lot of people get sidetracked because the explanations that are given in law school are a little bit vague and confusing. Now, the next set. So we put that piece of paper across. So we have a, the, our original sheet where we draw the, the concentric circles with PK, R, N inside each individual circle that belongs to its own realm. And now we have, we've already taken care of the specific intent crimes. Okay, now what's next? Well, let's take the next sheet, the third sheet of paper, where the same thing was drawn on it. And this time, let's color in everything. We're going to cover in the purposely, knowingly, and recklessly. We're going to leave the negligence part out of this. We're going to leave that blank at this point. But we're going to cover in those three in, inside circles. What kind of crimes are those? Those are malice crimes. Now, the logic of this dictates that you can commit a malice crime with specific intent. Good malice crimes murder. You can desire to murder somebody, so you can commit it with specific intent. You can also commit a malice crime if you are aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk. Okay? Uh, for instance, uh, murder is a malice crime. You can desire to kill someone. You can also commit murder, you know, if you just decide one day that you're going to, you know, target practice at the sign across the street, even though, you know, cars pass by there all the time. That's a substantial and unjustifiable risk because what happens when you target practice at the sign across the street where the cars are driving by what's the probability you know substantial probability that you know somebody's going to drive their car by but at the very moment you fire the bullet and the bullet's going to impact on them and kill them you know it's quite high okay you're an evil person too but it's quite high so you can commit malice crimes two ways you can commit them recklessly or you can commit them with specific intent this is all set theory now. Now, let's take the third or fourth sheet. Let's cover in everything. Because when we cover in everything, those are called general intent crimes. 
good general intent crime is battery. You can, how many different ways can you commit battery if you're catching on to this analysis? You can commit a battery with specific intent, right? Because you purposely desired it or there was a substantial certainty that a battery would occur. You can commit a battery with malice because you can, you can, you know, you can have that, the recklessness and you're aware of the substantial and unjustifiable risk. And the third way you can commit a battery is with general intent or criminal negligence. Remember, it's the same as civil negligence, but it's a higher degree of risk and a higher degree of harm. So you, you can have you have three different ways to commit batteries. You have two different ways to commit malice crimes. You have just basically one way or two intents to commit specific intent crimes, purposely and knowingly. You see that? You see how they group together in subsets. Now what does all this mean? Well, you can't transfer intents in criminal law. It is das verboten to do that. If you have a dwelling endangering state of mind, you can't transfer that intent of a dwelling endangering state of mind into a person endangering state of mind. You cannot have transferred intent in criminal law. It's just the social policy that they, they developed a long time ago. It's, 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 it's forbidden. You can't do it. Can you transfer intents in civil law? Well, yes, certainly you can. Remember, if you if you've taken torts already, you have the transferred intent doctrine. You know, where if you commit any one of the five common law intentional torts: assault, battery, false imprisonment, trespass, the land, and trespass, the chattels. If you commit any one of them, if you set an act in motion with the intent to, let's say, commit a battery. Let's say you want to throw a baseball. That's your next door neighbor because you hate him, um, and he's making fun of you while your team's losing at the World Series. So you grab your baseball, and you throw it across at your next door neighbor. And this is civil now. We're not talking criminal, okay? Well, what's the act of throwing at him while he's looking at him? That's an assault, all right? Well, what's the act when the baseball crosses your property line to his property line? Well, that's a trespass to land. And because you had intended to commit assault, what are you liable for? Trespass to land. If neighbor isn't too quick and he can't duck fast enough and the baseball hits him, what's that? Because you intended to assault, that's a battery. Right? Let's say the baseball hits him, falls down, breaks his iced tea glass, okay? Lands on his property, all right? What's that? That's trespass the chattels because originally you had the intent to do what? To assault the person. Now, get this one. When the baseball first hit him, it didn't hit him that hard and didn't have that much effect and it was a battery. But because the glass broke and is laying on the ground, he steps on the glass, cuts his foot, and now he can't move. Can't go anywhere. And when he cut his foot, he fell down, knocked himself out. What's that? False imprisonment. So you've committed every tort in the book just by throwing a baseball at somebody. Can you do that in criminal law? The answer is uncategorically no. So anytime somebody mentions the word transferred intent in the context of criminal law, the little antennas in your brain just start rolling up big time. It's like, whoa, what are you talking about? Because you can't be talking about the transferred intent that's in civil law. Because there is no such thing as transferred intent in criminal law. You can't transfer the intent to commit arson to murder because arson is a dwelling endangering state of mind, not a person endangering state of mind. You can't do that. But what are they talking about? Well, they're improperly using words that have dual meanings, and that's bad, particularly for people that are first learning to learn the law and you're trying to understand what's going on because the words have a tendency to invoke certain responses. What are they talking about? Well, geez, they're talking about that complex set theory, and actually not complex, quite simple set theory, uh, where there's different ways to commit a grouping crime. Okay? Malice is a grouping crime. You can commit it with purposing, knowing which is specific intent, or you can commit it with malice, which is recklessness. 
So here's what happens when you do, let's say you intend specifically to kill somebody. It's that next door neighbor again. After he gets out of the hospital, he wins the suit, right? <laughs> He's got you. You know, he got a half million dollar judgment against you. Now you're really mad. So now you're sitting outside your house and you are waiting. You're lying in wait and you've got your easy rider rifle rack, you know, gun. You're ready to kill him. Okay, and as he steps out of his car, you know, again, he's clumsy. He slips and falls. And, but you shoot your gun at him the very minute he steps out of his car. And, and just by chance, you miss him. And poor, poor old little grandma's next door, you know, with, that always invites the kids over for ice cream and candy. You know, the nice woman in the neighborhood. And the bullet impacts her and kills her. Now... What was your preliminary crime? Well, your preliminary crime was a specific intent to kill. And that specific intent to kill is a person endangering state of mind, which brings up the, a malice crime. So, even though you had a specific intent to kill, the, because you're, you're engaged in a malice crime, that bullet, the act that you put in motion, left your rifle barrel with malice. That's the set theory. If you in specifically intend to commit murder, any act you put in motion is a malice act as a minimum. So that act, until it comes to rest, travels around with malice as a minimum, even though your only desire was to do a specific intent crime. Because our common law ancestors, what they wanted to do is they wanted to find people liable for you know placing these terrible acts in motion. How do you do that? You do that with set theory. Okay, You can't transfer the intents, but you do it with set theory. So... What happens is, is when you know Joe Schmuckatelli, your next door neighbor, slips and falls and the bullet misses him, you're liable to him for an attempted murder, which is you know a very serious crime. But when that bullet impacts Grandma next door, who takes care of all the local little kids and treats them real nice and everything, and has the beautiful lawn, when it impacts her, that bullet because it missed, but it's still traveling around from the initial act, impacts her. That impacts her with malice, the recklessness. Okay. Let's change the equation. Let's say you got your baseball back again, and you really hate that sob next door because now he's won the half million bucks, and he's laughing at you. Let's change the crime. Let's just say again you throw the baseball at him. Okay. Now you have the specific intent to throw the baseball at him to hit him. You want to assault and batter him. Again, he slips. He misses. Now, throwing a baseball isn't necessarily a person endangering crime. It could be a deadly weapon, depending on how you throw it, okay? Because it could kill somebody, you know, depending on who it hits, like Grandma. But let's just call this, we're going to commit the specific intent crime of battery. Now, how can we commit battery? Well, we can commit battery, what, with specific intent, purposely and knowingly. We can commit battery with malice. We can, you know, add the recklessness to it. Or we can commit battery negligently. So we have three basic different ways to commit battery. Because we committed it with specific intent, and we put a specific intent act in motion for a general intent crime, what is, those, what is that act that we put in motion traveling around with? Well, it's traveling around with recklessness and negligence as well. So if it impacts grandma next door, guess what we're going down for? Battery. Do you understand that concept? It's they use set theory to find culpability for the act you put into motion. Now, if all we ever did was put a negligent act in motion, okay, that negligent act comes to rest. Let's say we were, you know, practicing our baseball hitting, uh, and we were purposely hitting, you know, uh, trying to hit the cars that are across the street. As they travel across the street, you know, we have our little pit, automatic pitching arm baseball thing, and then we're just sitting there whacking baseballs across the street, trying to hit the sign across the street. Well, um, that's a recklessness, okay? You're committing a battery with the reckless state of mind because, uh, you know, there's you're aware of the practical certainty that you're going to hit somebody because, you know, you know, people drive through that street all the time, okay? Do you understand these things? But even though you're doing that recklessly, the, you're committing the battery recklessly, every time you hit one of those baseballs, if a battery occurs because of, you know, cause the baseball's traveling through the street, it, it always travels with what minimum level 
of the grouping crime. So it'll at least also travel with negligence, criminal negligence. So that's the set theory of criminal law. That's how you determine whether or not the act you put into motion when it impinges upon somebody, they're going to be liable for it. Okay? So, and and this set theory was developed based on the seriousness of the crimes. You know, you don't want somebody committing a specific intent murder getting away with it just because the bullet impinges upon grandma. And you didn't intend to kill her. Boy, you know, lots of people would be running around stating that as a defense. This is also why the felony murder rule was created. One of the reasons why. One, it, it supplies an easier way to show the person endangering state of mind because you committed an inherently dangerous felony. But see, remember, we can't transfer intent. We can't say just because you committed an arson and Grandma died from the embers flowing over to her home. Okay, she died in her home because her home was set on fire. We can't say that your your person in your you know your your dwelling endangering state of mind against Schmuckatella because you hate his guts now can be transferred over to Grandma and that's why she died. No, we use the felony murder rule that say, hey. You committed a, a, a very serious crime that is in itself person endangering. Because you've committed that crime, we're going to hold you liable for an unintended death occurring within the rest just day of that crime. Okay, That's why the felony murder rule was created, to take care of some of the, the inabilities to transfer intent amongst the various mental intents of criminal law. You can't transfer intent in criminal law. But you can you can create the malice that's necessary for murder. In other words, the recklessness by using the felony murder rule and saying that this dwelling endangering state of mind okay, is enough to get you or the specific intent to break and enter into someone else's house is such a serious enough um, um, act that it in it in and of itself it, it always implies a person endangering state of mind. Okay, so these things you have to understand. These these are all technical, and for those that don't understand the technicality of it, I can trick you very easily on exams, on bar exams, on multiple choice questions by just lay, laying into you with transferred intent. Now, commentators and cases they use this they use the word transferred intent in criminal law to express that set theory that we talked about where geez you want to commit a specific intent murder and the bullet leaves the gun well the bullet travels around with the minimum level of uh, of of the crime that you're committing shooting at someone is a person endangering crime a person endangering crime is a malice crime you can commit malice by specific intent or reckless intent okay well, when you commit it with specific intent, that bullet is still traveling around with what? Reckless intent until it comes to rest. Well, it came to rest in Grandma's chest and she's dead. Guess what you're going down for? Murder. You're going to get attempted murder for the next door neighbor and you're going to get murder on Grandma. So you understand how that works? It's technical. Be technical with it. If people misuse the term or try to confuse you between the two, 